Hello. So there's this thing in cryptography called a trusted third party. Uh, the setup is generally something like Alice and Bob want to securely communicate, but they can only do it through Trent, a trusted third party. Trusted third parties make systems vulnerable, because if you really want to mess with Alice and Bob, the obvious thing to do is to do it through Trent, especially if Trent is filling in this role for lots of other people. Problem solvers spent a lot of time and energy trying to limit the kind of information that the trusted third party receives, or to shield them from attack, or more drastically, to remove them from the equation entirely. Today, I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin, which is an example of such a solution. If I were giving this talk last year or the year before, I would probably go through what Bitcoin is, um, who invented it, when it was invented, uh, what the uses are, whether it's likely to succeed. But since then, there's been a number of major news stories that you probably have been exposed to. And so even if you don't know what Bitcoin is, you probably know that it's internet money that Mark Andreessen is really into for some reason, and this guy created it, or maybe he didn't. It's, um, but let's talk about Bitcoin 101. Like, in one sentence, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger of irreversible transactions, where the broadcasting of the ledger is incentivized by randomly awarding new Bitcoins at a fixed rate proportional to the computing power expended. Really simple. But let's go through that again. So beer, Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger we all know what BitTorrent is. Uh, it's peer-to-peer -peer in the same way. Bitcoin isn't hosted in one place. It's, it exists as the sum of its users. It's, they're all broadcasting the network together. Irreversible transactions. There's no chargebacks. You send the payment, and once it's resolved, it's resolved. Because the ledger is distributed, each node has to keep communicating with all the other nodes in, under, in order for the ledger to keep going. If the nodes don't broadcast new transactions, the transactions don't resolve, which is why you have this thing called mining. In order to get the payments to go through faster, the network basically pays the other nodes to keep communicating with the network, uh, to use their computing power to keep the ledger going. This is, uh, you set your computer to mine, and it communicates with the network over and over again, the blockchain keeps increasing, and you're participating in a lottery scheme for new Bitcoins, essentially. So that's Bitcoin 101. I think we're ready for Bitcoin 102. If what I said doesn't quite click for you, it's because in like 101 style, I left out huge chunks of information to try and generalize. Uh, it's, I use the word ledger, but the technical term is blockchain. And you've probably heard of that before. So let's say this is the blockchain. Each previous block in the blockchain is totally resolved. The book is closed on those transactions. So any transactions that are happening after that last block are now going to be part of the new block. These are being broadcast to all the nodes, and the nodes are taking this information, this giant sort of string of information, and then they're adding little bits of random uh, numerals or characters or just little random bits of information at the end of that uh, to try and basically randomize the information that they have, and then they process the unresolved block through a cryptographic hash function over and over again with a new random bit at the end. And they're doing this because when you have a cryptographic hash function, you get a random result every time. So what they're doing is they're playing cryptographic slots. They're trying to get the string that has four zeros at the end or whatever condition that they're supposed to fulfill. And when they fulfill that condition, bam, they get some money. Right now, that reward is set at about 25 bitcoins per block. Um, that's going to change over time. It has already changed over time. But that's what I mean by a lottery system. As long as all the transactions inside the new block make sense, and there's like no one trying to spend money that they don't have, or double spending the money that they do have, then the block resolves, and then you move on to the next block, rinse and repeat. And the most important thing is that the blockchain is fraud-proof. As long as a majority of the computer computing power is controlled by honest users, um, that's like 51% of the computing power in the network, the majority of the work is going into making an honest chain, 
as opposed to the dishonest chain. Like, let's say there's some nefarious attacker out there that's trying to control the network and forge like a fake ledger that has all the money given to like them. But they need to have 51% of the power. Um, as long as we assume that no one has 50, like no malicious attacker has 51% of the power, we know what the honest chain is because it's just the longest one. It's whatever has the most power behind it. When I first started studying Bitcoin, I was really interested in what I like to call the big question, which is, is it money? That's not the right question, of course, because if you want to like, talk about, well, how can this arbitrary unit of value have any uh, meaning in the real world, you're going to get into some really metaphysical questions about like, actual fiat currency. For me, the question is something more like, what is money anyways? And Bitcoin is sort of a running experiment to determine what money is and who's right about it. There's a lot of traditions in theorizing money. In the 16th and 17th century, it was uh, the metalists and the chartalists. It's a distinction that's only somewhat outdated. Like You could say that the metalists are modern-day monetarists and the chartalists are modern-day Keynesians. If that means anything to you, it doesn't really matter. The key dispute here is what is the role of the government in making money? Like, no matter which way you cut it, the government is involved in making money. They create it, they distribute it, they regulate it, they circulate it, they tax it. But can money exist without a government? Is centralized authority intrinsic to the value of money, or is it incidental? Does government merely serve the function of authentication by stamping the coin with an imprimatur? Or is there something more fundamental in the act of issuing and taxing currency? Is the value of the money the gold in the coin, or is it the face of the king? In other words, how necessary is this trusted third party? Bitcoin approaches money from this very angle. It looks at it as though it were a protocol in which Alice wants to pay Bob, but is forced to go through the government as a trusted third party intermediary. This is, of course, a really simplified picture of money. Looks more like this in the United States. Let's ignore that, though. Let's pretend we never saw that slide. Uh, Bitcoin eliminates the trusted third party by decentralizing money, distributing it, automating it. Uh, and in order to properly do this, it has to make transactions irreversible. I mean, if you think about it, like what would it mean to have a distributed ledger where you can revoke your transaction at any time? Like That would mean anarchy. It wouldn't work. So you lose access to things like chargebacks, fraud alerts, dispute resolution. And that's a feature, not a bug. And I quote from the white paper, the cost of mediation increases transaction costs, limiting the minimum practical transaction size, and cutting off the possibility for small casual transactions. And there is a broader cost in the loss of ability to make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services. With the possibility of reversal, the need for trust spreads. Merchants must be wary of their customers, hassling them for more information than they would otherwise need. A certain percentage of fraud is accepted as unavoidable. These costs and payment uncertainties can be avoided in person by using physical currency. But no mechanism exists to make payments over a communications channel without a trusted third party. Let's talk now about the conditions under which Bitcoin was created. You don't see any grand political statements in the white paper. Um, and this is actually surprising because Bitcoin isn't the first cryptocurrency, like a digital currency that's uh, backed by cryptographic proofs. The first I know of was actually proposed in 1985 in an article that has this incredibly charming title, Security Without Identification, Transaction Systems to Make Big Brother Obsolete. Um, and then you see sort of a sketch of an idea floating around in 1998, uh, a proposal for a currency called B-Money. And this is directly linked to an idea called crypto anarchy, the political belief that cryptographic technologies will and should be used to neutralize government power over individuals. And then you jump to 2008 and the publication of Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. And you don't really see explicit political motivations expressed in the white paper, but it's 2008. The context is clear. The trusted third party that Bitcoin is trying to eliminate is the banking industry. There's a thing with the blocks in the blockchain where you can encode messages, and they just sort of stay there because the blockchain is forever. 
And the very first block, the Genesis block, contains this message. Bitcoin was born in a crisis, in a breakdown, in a lapse of trust. So even if you can't trust in banks, in the government, in the dollar, in the euro, at least you can trust the math. Bruce Schneier has this great book on trust called Liars and Outliers, and it opens with this paragraph, and I'm going to not do my Bruce Schneier voice because that would be pretty terrible. Just today, a stranger came to my door claiming that he was here to unclog a bathroom drain. I let him into my house without verifying his identity, and not only did he repair the drain, he also took off his shoes so that he wouldn't track mud on my floors. When he was done, I gave him a piece of paper that asked my bank to give him some money. He accepted it without a second glance. At no point did he attempt to take my possessions. At no point did I attempt the same of him. In fact, neither of us worried that the other would. My wife was also home, but it never occurred to me that he was a sexual rival and I should therefore kill him. It's what we call trust. Actually, it's what we call civilization. And Schneider calls this civilization, which I find interesting because it actually really reminds me of this portion of David Graeber's essay on, are you an anarchist? The answer may surprise you. Graeber writes, if there's a line to get on a crowded bus, do you wait your turn and refrain from elbowing your way past others even in the absence of police? If you answered yes, then you're used to acting like an anarchist. The most basic anarchist principle is self-organization, the assumption that human beings do not need to be threatened with prosecution in order to be able to come to reasonable understandings with each other or to treat each other with dignity and respect. I don't know if trust is somehow fundamental or natural, but I do think that human beings want to trust each other and the systems around them. It's just easier that way. Creating working systems without trusted third parties is hard. It's inconvenient. A lot of the time you have to come up with elaborate technological circumventions in order to achieve the same results that a centralized trust-based system would produce. We got Bitcoin in 2009, but we had ledger-based credit systems and rudimentary banking as early as the fourth millennium BC. This is second millennium BC, very late in the banking game. I hope you can see that Bitcoin is an elaborate solution to a very particular problem, which means that Bitcoin is the answer only if you think that the problem it addresses in the first place is a problem at all. When Bitcoin was first starting out, it had a pretty obvious flaw. Money is money if people accept it. Uh, but there's no point in using digital money if no one else is using it. Part of early Bitcoin evangelism was basically convincing other businesses to like take Bitcoin or to like set up things where you could translate Bitcoin into real life goods and services like Domino's pizza gift certificates. That was a really popular one early on. The obvious thing that happened was that people started sending, setting up exchanges where you could exchange Bitcoin for government issued currency. And then they'd charge transaction fees and anyone could see that there was going to be like a lot of money in this. And then a funny thing started to happen around 2011 or so. Exchanges got hacked and massive amounts of Bitcoin got lost. Some of the exchanges turned out to be Ponzi schemes. Um, again, massive amounts of Bitcoin are lost. Uh, the price goes up and the price goes down. Um, and by 2012, the Bitcoin Foundation comes into existence. And um, in their words, they are a nonprofit that focuses and unlocks all of your energy and talents towards promoting Bitcoins, protecting them, and increasing their legitimacy through standardization. In 2013 and 24, early 2014, the vast bulk of fiat to Bitcoin trading is happening through one exchange, Mt. Gox, which wields so much influence over the market that whenever the exchange goes temporarily offline due to technical malfunctions, the price fluctuates. You start seeing here also an expectation that the exchanges will perform chargebacks on transactions that go wrong on their end. Uh, in other words, if Mt. Gox gets hacked, Mt. Gox owes you money. This seems really sensible, but think about how Bitcoin works. Once a transaction happens, it happens. If you trusted your, entrusted your money to Mt. Gox, that's an irreversible transaction. Why would you expect there to be basically liability insurance on a cryptocurrency. But that's, that was the expectation. So people are fighting the blockchain's own DNA, placing their trust in third parties inside the system that's designed to get rid of trusted third parties. By 2013, you start to see regulation coming from all sides. 
FinCEN sets out rules for the exchanges. The SEC goes after one of the Ponzi schemes. Uh, the IRS makes a determination on the taxability of Bitcoin. This is all US-centric, I know, because I study the US law on Bitcoin. I don't have a broad global understanding. Um, as it turns out, it's very hard to determine the Thai law on Bitcoin without being able to read Thai. Uh, so Bitcoin might have been a, a reaction to the financial system, but today it's actually part of the financial system. When I was asked to do this talk, one of the suggestions was to give three takeaway points. These are my takeaways. Trustless systems are hard. People like trust. People will add trust even where it doesn't belong. And you know, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. Systems should conform to people rather than the other way around. I think the story of Bitcoin is the story of a radical, fascinating, ingenious, revolutionary tool that's just not a great fit for actual, breathing, living human beings in 21st century global capitalism. I don't mean to say that Bitcoin is useless or bad or over. It's still going. People use it. Uh, I think it's like at like $600 per Bitcoin right now. I mean that it's not being used the way it's supposed to be. It's like taking a screwdriver and trying to hammer nails with it. My hope is that you can look at this as an illustration and think hard about the systems you create. Where does trust belong? Where does distrust belong? How are users apt to behave? There's no such thing as a framework that is free of politics and human error. Trust comes naturally to us, and trust enables and facilitates interaction. And this is despite the fact that trust is, if you think about it, kind of a human error. It's an error that under certain, certain conditions, because there's certain conditions where you're not supposed to trust people, trust is something to embrace, enjoy, and encourage. Our goal should be to generate the conditions under which trust flourishes instead of removing them from the equation entirely. Thank you.